Oh, there we go. There we go, bro. There Much we go. better. Much better. Yeah. So let me lean oh, so it back. You, so you got your uh, great beard going on, going on yeah, as well. Yeah, man. I, I, hey, people <laughs> have not seen me in a while. So this is this is what happens in quarantine life. <laughs> um, it can be good for you. You just got to just figure out what works and keeps your mind <laughs> Uh, from going crazy and my barber because I didn't get to see him this started doing this and um, <laughs> and then they just caught on the kids kept fussing with me telling me let it go let it you yeah, know, let it go let it go try to let it go as long as uh, Idris Elba in the Thor Thor movie you seen him in Thor they, uh, want it, they want it down here I can't do that man I'm I'm a little bit more of a clean cut so <laughs> Somebody said the quarantine look is working. All right, I appreciate it. That's Thank Kate. You love. Okay, thanks, Kate. Good to see you. Yeah, Kate and Gina are on. Uh, okay. I'm actually, uh, well, I'm talking. Hopefully, talking to Gina. They're both big time. You know, I'm I'm, I'm so blessed to be around all these big time people. Uh, so I appreciate you coming on and sharing a few minutes with me. Absolutely. Um, and I know hopefully we can solve some of the world's problems today uh, with, you know, a couple, couple things, I, you know, a couple things I want to talk to you about. Of course, FSU days, kind of get your thought process <laughs> during that time. Yep. Um, the MBDL, kind of where they, where they are today. I know you were um, like running that at one point. And so mm -hmm. just kind of get us, take us to where you started, to where it is today. Um, and then, of course, we want to talk about the uh, national, I mean, the uh, name, image, and likeness, the educational component. I know we've had some great discussions about it, and you have some yep. things going on with your business and what you're trying to get accomplished there. And then yep. the last thing I want to talk about is organic farming. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. And, uh, and so I know, I know that's near and dear to your heart, like in your backyard. <laughs> <laughs> so All I right. wanna definitely want to talk uh, talk about that a little bit, but um, just initially, kind of just talk to me about um, you, the CEO and principal of Pro Two CEO. What what actually is that? So Pro oh, CEO, I should say. Yeah, so Pro to CEO is a transition company. We specialize in aggregating solutions for athletes. Uh, teams, organizations, you know, public and private businesses around making your move into another area of success. So when you're a former athlete and you got to make your move, we often get that call. We've been extremely busy in the midst of COVID. Obviously, nobody's playing until right now. So it's been very healthy to be able to help people see what they could possibly be doing now with this newfound time. And we've, we've been helping football to basketball players, to former players. And what's been really cool is people have been bringing a lot of stuff to us to help us, to help them find a solution that they've been kind of always wanting to do. So I find it um, very uh, enterprising. Five years ago, when I wanted to, to sort of look at what could I do differently, I'd been at the NBA almost 14 seasons and I wanted to, to do something different. So the same things I coached the players are, I just did for myself. I tapped my network. Mm -hmm. um, I began to believe more in what I could do and what versus what I can. So I had more faith in my faith than faith in my fear. Mm -hmm. And I just stepped out with support of fam and uh, began to work on this diligently. I had two partners, my brother and Terrell Whitley, and then evolved the business. And now, you know, we really work hard at helping um, universities college teams uh even amateur aau has been a client and then like just providing uh amicable solutions to help them be profitable and um and at the same time you know obviously we we have a fee base on that but it's worked out well man i get to work from home you know i did the office up the way i like you see that florida state on the wall go seminoles uh, yeah so uh, <laughs> so it's it's been good well that's good um i know you've you probably you definitely helped a lot of people and that's one of the things i know when i when i talk to athletes a lot of times uh they, they of course we'll talk a little bit about the the name image and likeness uh but i think there are just more factors to that um that that whole piece 
when it comes to name, image, and likeness, and using that to be able to help you transition to whatever it is that you're going to do, even if it's not pro ball. Even I mean, if it is pro ball, even with that, you still can use it to help you transition um, in life. And I know just for myself, when it came down to transitioning, it came back down to probably one of your fundamental principles, which is just <laughs> relationships. And you just talked about that. Um, and I know for me, you know, I really didn't have, I really didn't know what I was going to do after I, um, after I uh, got injured mm -hmm. and I couldn't play anymore. And I had a, you know, talk with my mom and my wife, Tanja. And, you know, it was like, well, you know, I want to go into business in some form or fashion, but that was cool. But that just wasn't my passion. <laughs> you know, that just, yeah. it wasn't, a, it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't like I had, I had a business going, you know, t-shirt, Christian t-shirt, uh, Christian, um, clothing line uh, happening uh, at one point. But, you know, we kind of dibbled and dabbled um, in some, um, what is it? Um, what, the company where you weightlifting. Um, I'm, okay. I'm trying, gyms, uh, fit, some gyms. Business. Fit gyms. Yeah, yeah we, we dibbled and dabbled in that, and God kind of closed that door. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, but I, I eventually got into, you know, coaching. And I was like, man, I don't yeah. think I can be a great, I can be a coach because there was a lot of things that I, I thought I did naturally, which I did. But there's a lot of things when I started looking back, man, I had been taught a lot of things. And so, mm -hmm. um, so Coach Van Gundy, who was my lifeblood through the NBA, I mean, he, he gave me jobs at, at every stint, you know. And so, um, you know, I was just indebted to him, been indebted to him for quite some time because he, helped me to transition to what I'm doing today, which is high school coaching. Sure. Uh, but it's all built around relationships. Is that what it you're is. finding? Yeah, it, it really is. Every job that I had, Charlie, was based on my ability to connect with somebody who knew what I wanted to do. Uh, I was gifted with the ability to say uh, and find right the right people who were in powerful positions. Mm -hmm. and ones of influence or they could even hire me so when i found a couple of those what i call mentors i just latched on man and my first job at florida state i really got because i went to lunch with my boss and she was like come and connect with this guy that's interviewing and that was dr gruders back then i don't know if mm -hmm. you remember him no. and um he was over academic support and he hired me he said man i like your energy what are you going to do when you graduate? I was like, hey, I'm going to go into human resource management because there was no sports management back then. Oh, I wanted wow. to work with athletes because my brother had went to college and he had failed out. And I said, what is it about him failing out? I want to work with this population. So I got in and not on top with football, basketball, man, they put me with golf, tennis, <laughs> cross country, and, um, and track and field. Now, the thing about that I will tell everybody is don't block your blessing mm -hmm. because I joined the golf team um, and went out to the 19th hole. I had never been out to a country club at 23. They gave me a country club membership because I had to go out and visit the golf club. Well, think about it now, Charlie. I play golf. I live next to a golf course, and my, my three kids play golf. So uh -huh. I'm passing it along. If I would have said, now nah, I later for the golf, I wouldn't be able to do that. And I learned a lot about tennis and track and field. And I just learned, you know, and the biggest thing for my first mentor, he said, man, you're not going to do football and basketball. Grow where you're planted. Mm. So I think a lot of people miss their first opportunity because they shoot so big. Yeah. And so when you're offered in sports that ticket sale job and you're not at the top, take it if it's the right thing because you're going to learn. And that springboarded me to – uh, a first startup company called Inroads. At 28, I was doing Inroads in Central Florida, and that was a diversity company. So I started learning about diversity very early, and mm -hmm. then I kept getting calls from Michigan State when I was there, and that was all relationships because Gruders had moved from Florida State to Michigan State, so he mm -hmm. wanted me to join him at Michigan State. So my boss wanted to hire me twice. You see, what I'm saying uh, because right. I had done a good job with the track. hear me now yes i can hear you now 
Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I went from there, I went from there to Michigan State, and man, just won a championship there. Like won at Michigan State with you. I mean, at Florida State with you, and then from there, I got my call to the NBA. Called me out of the blue and said, "Look, we heard about you. I come and um, join us at the NBA, and I started the G League." In the G League, um, well, it's called the D D League MBDL. You're correct by saying that. And then we just evolved that business from six teams. When the time I left, we had about 19. And then I had also become a vice president on both sides of the business as the first vice president of social responsibility and player programs for the NBA and the NBA Development League. So, man, just a lot of like first for me and had a wonderful ride with the league, got to travel to all the parts of the world, went as far as Australia, um, other side of the world, just building basketball businesses and building <clears throat> credibility for the NBA brand. And then I decided to, to transition to pro to CEO because I wanted to do more and diversify my experience. So man, that's what it's, it's been like for me. Yes. Uh, well, I think that's uh, some of the things that you mentioned are very uh, important and key to, um, I think, all the people who have seen great success over the course of their time and they're doing things now uh, that they're kind of wanting to do uh, because you kind of started at a place in the area where you were excited to be in that area and mm -hmm. you kind of blossom because of your work ethic. Um, the time that you put in and, and people saw your value where you were. Um, and you didn't look at the job as, man, I, this is beneath me, or why am I here? Um, sometimes you just have to look at where you are. Yes, I'm mm -hmm. a first-time, you know, first-time um, employer, and I'm going to get probably the jobs that nobody else wants. Right. And so, like you say, you gotta you got to enjoy being planted wherever you are and then blossom and grow uh, from that because I always – I'm a big believer that – I mean, I know – Someone's always watching. Yep. And they're watching your attitude. They're watching how you do your business. Mm -hmm. They're watching you do all your necessary things. And you never know where that's going to mushroom you to uh, give you an opportunity next. Uh, because, it, like you said, it could block your blessing in a sense if you're doing things because you have a bad attitude. Like, man, you know, how long am I going to get before I get promoted? I see my buddy mm -hmm. over here who's just who just came in with me. You know, he got promoted before I did. And you, your attitude and everything. Of course, we have all those. I'm not saying we're not human. Those things do happen in our mindset. But at some point mm -hmm. in time, you got to be like, man, I'm, I'm going to keep grinding. I'm going to keep working. And right. so when God calls me to be promoted, it's going to be something that I know I've earned over the course right. of time. And so... Where you are today, of course, you kind of took us through the journey. Mm -hmm. um, but I just want to ask you the – now it's, I think it's the G League. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm not going to say that name, why, why it's G League, but <laughs> it has something to do with the people down, uh, down the interstate. But mm -hmm. um, <laughs> what um, – you know, now I, I keep throwing this out and I keep seeing this that kids now they, they have a high school entry level position in the G League. And I'm sure that's something that was talked about and probably implemented going through your days uh, of making it happen to where it is today. Um, could you just break down how that came about? Sure. Um, so the G League, you know, when we first started the started the development league, now the G League, it really was to try to grow basketball in the South. And if uh, you guys can remember, all the teams were in the Southeast at first, man. They were in like uh, Columbus, Georgia, Huntsville, Fayetteville, Asheville, Greenville, Huntsville. Man, I was going to all the Vils, bro. Just trying to <laughs> grow. You make it in Thomasville. <laughs> <laughs> I did not make it to Thomas. Thomasville wasn't big enough for the G League, although a great place uh, to be born and raised. So I, I do give a shout out to Thomasville. What's up, y'all? And um, the thing about it was, back the the South wasn't ready. 
So all those businesses fail, Charlie. So think mm -hmm. about us having to pivot and say, where are the trends going? And I think people, you got to know where to do your homework and, and be able to build something and pivot quickly if something's not working. So we kind of teamed up with a CBA and bought their teams. And then we put some pods of teams in cities like um, Austin, Texas. We knew it was growing in Austin. And then way at the bottom, Hildago, Texas, near Mc McAllen and the border, we knew it was growing. So, you know, a lot of good research. And then we just began to say, you know, one day we got to play, payer, play payer, players better so they'll want to stay stateside. And I believe that's where Sharif Abdul Rahim is now. He's been able to find a way to to get the teams to be valued by the NBA as a talent resource pool. We were slow in getting the NBA to buy into it. And then now what they've got is they're looked at as total as development league for 10 guys. They almost can pay 10, 12 guys where they can pay a one NBA guy who sits at the end of the bench. So when you design a team for that guy, he has some competition to come down and play. And they really started investing in coaches, technology, using the same offensive, defensive schemes, training tables, all that cool stuff that NBA uh, next level guys want. They, they got it. And they finally got the formula right. So every NBA team is required to have one. And then they, I think they got real smart and figured out a pro pathway. That's what's the name of the program yeah. is where the high school guys, they get to make a certain amount of money if you're projected to be a lottery pick or a pretty high pick. And you stay stateside and you learn all the innuendos of playing in an NBA business, very short. And, you know, if you're not a college guy, you get to do it. So let's say a guy like LaMelo Ball, he may have been able to benefit, you know, if it was put together. He may or may not have played in it because of, you know, the entrepreneurial aspects of their family because right. they, you know, certainly are entrepreneurs. But at the same time, now we have a, a real solid pathway for those high potential guys. You've seen about three guys declare one international, two stateside, big, big names that most colleges would love to have right. um, already in the program. And they're doing a good job developing. I know they're spending time with them now, getting them ready. Uh, obviously, G League didn't have a season this year. NBA is going to be back uh, very shortly. So I think uh, what you'll see in the future is a really stable model for tweener guys who just got cut. They're going to stay aligned with their NBA team and be ready to go. But also this new high school group of guys that they just want to play. And, you know, back in the day, Charlie, when you played, there was so much question mark around, you know, should the athlete leave? And now it's very clear, you know, your talent – is a window of opportunity. And if you do it right, you can go back to school um, if you want to. There's always value in going to school too with the NIL now right. um, and the opportunities that is presented. So, you know, I would say it really depends on what level you think you are and get a lot of good counsel around it because we've been kind of talking about this for a little while, right? Yeah. Uh, that's one of the things, um, and when people ask me, you know, about uh, my MBA, how did I make it to the MBA, um, you know, I always just, I take them through, you know, I, I chose to play basketball my senior year, which left the options open. Um, but the biggest key for me was I made a decision and I was going to live with the consequences. And, or what I mean by that is, I made a decision to keep my options open, which meant mm -hmm. that I was squeezing off the NFL or right. the NBA if you wanted to look at it both ways. And so Either I was way. trying to figure that part out. But I had made a calculated risk that I was going to leave my options open so that I could have an opportunity to play in both if that was, you know, what God had called, called me to do. Right. And so I took that risk knowing that the – NFL might not have gotten drafted, you know, because I wasn't 100% committed. And then the statement that I made about if I didn't get drafted in the first round, that I would be considering my other options or I would consider my other options. And so, you know, that, of course, as you know, didn't fly very well. <laughs> right, right. Well, well, but that like, wasn't your fault, man. That was not your fault, though, right? Right. I mean, so I'm just saying, it was, yes, it, it was just what it was. And I made my decision based on the knowledge that I'd had and I had to live with the consequences. 
And so with me not being drafted in the NFL, it was no need for me to get upset because mm -hmm. I had put myself in that position um, because I wasn't 100% committed, you know. And so I understood that, knew that. And the reason I said that is because, you know, that's the one thing that I always tell kids, even in high school when I'm coaching them, you know, leave yourself, give yourself options if that's what you sure. want to do. You know, don't, you know, don't pigeonhole yourself um, into just one, doing one thing if you have the ability to do multiple things. And so right. when we talk about kids going to college or going to the pros right out of high school, for, it's called basketball, um, baseball, they do it. But basketball, I'm like, do it. You know, if that's right. what you want to do, go ahead and do it. And, and there's nothing mm -hmm. against the NCAA, nothing against the college. That's your right. If you want to go overseas, do it. And just right. live with whatever the consequences are. And as you talk about, you know, the educational component, I think it's very, very important uh, that they get great counseling because if they don't have it, they're going to be short-lived like we've seen you know, some guys who aren't getting good counseling when they come into the NBA, you know, after yeah. three, two, two years or a year, or whatever it is in, in college. Yeah. Well, let me, let me stop you there, Charlie, because I know you're saying what you're saying is so true. And, and, and for those student athletes, parents, you know, you have a friend or a brother or, you know, a emerging athlete, I really want them to listen to this. I'll never forget when I had a parent call me at the NBA and he says to me, hey, can you help me determine whether my son's draft eligible? And I was like, no, nah, we don't usually do that. He told me his son's name <clears throat> and, you know, he was trying to get his son to, you know, come out for the draft. And I was like, I don't think your son's ready. And, um, and he said, well, I think he is. And you know what he said to me, Charlie? He says, He's coming out anyway because I need a car. I need a car. And we need right to, to move. That is not the right <laughs> reason. And I was I was really taken back as his explanation. You know, we tired. We tired of taking on the practices. We're tired of sort of waiting. It's time. And he came out. And, you know, he made it by the skin of his teeth. He was not a lottery pick at all. He was in the last round of the second, you know, the second round, one of the likes. So it was really unfortunate that he came out too early. He had a had a roller coaster, short lived NBA career. And what I'm trying to help people understand is this is real business here. And if you're not careful, you will put your son or daughter in a situation very early that they could or could not make it. And you have to do a real good job at informing yourself. Uh, with this new NIL bill, I think it's going to do some people um, some good, but I do think that for a lot of the parents who have student athletes, particularly in football and basketball, need to make informed decisions. We've been at Pro to CEO really studying this. We've been in touch with a couple of senators uh, of what the policy is you know, I've talked to one of the most foremost uh, experts in the country, a gentleman out of California named Rami. Rami um, is, uh, started the bill years ago, back in 2010, as a student athlete um, at UCLA. And, you know, he's in front of it. So if you want to do any research on how well it's coming, he's the foremost expert. But I will say we believe that there needs to be education for the student athlete and for the parent. And I am encouraging anybody out there who knows that has a son or daughter, you, you got a nephew, a cousin, or a next door neighbor, a friend down the street, tell them to take their time on this. Because essentially what you're gonna be given the permission for in Florida is down the road. I mean, we're blazing to get there. Next year, actually people will be eligible to compete for scholarship uh, and the NIL at, in the state of Florida if you come yeah. here as a student athlete. So what that means is schools like Florida, Florida State, um, Miami, et cetera, UCF, I know everybody's going to say, oh, you left my school out. I get it. But <laughs> what I'm saying is all these Division I schools are going to be able to put their student athletes um, in, their, the student athletes are going to be able to possibly earn the income on their name, image, and likeness. But not everybody's going to be prepared. Right. And I want 
people to get prepared, make decisions based on education, make decisions based on fit, and mm -hmm. also decide if that coach is there or not, you still are okay with being there and make sure the academic, athletic, as well as right. living experience. Those are the first things I think right. should think about. The second, if you do and you're one of the precious few, one of the blessed few to possibly earn some income, you know, you want to get a management strategy because you're basically saying, I'm starting a business in college. Right. You're going to have to figure out all kinds of things that you'd never thought before. And somebody's going to have to manage that because as a student athlete, you still got to practice, still right. got to go to class, still got to recover from injuries. You might have to do special, uh, uh, if you're not a strong student, you're going to do a lot of rem remediation. It's going to be hard to balance all this and think about that with an obligation of a contract now. And if you're a busy student athlete, you really have ev never really worked when you're an elite athlete at a real business sometimes. So there's going to be some new mental and emotional and physical work uh, from this. And then the family themselves, yeah. be prepared for taxes, be prepared for contract readings, be prepared for mitigating legal and contract breaches if you don't do what you need to do. So there's a ton on the table here that we've got to prepare. And that's what we've been doing We've been trying to get people ready for this. Uh, we think um, that uh, particularly uh, football and basketball culture is going to see a lot. But I do think it's going to do a lot for women. Uh, I do think there are some female athletes who are extremely talented. They're finally going to get a good audience and a good chance to uh, capitalize on opportunities that come their way. So I like this if it's managed well, right. if it's educated and, and informed. And people are really looking at this with their eyes wide open. You know, I'm wanting to, to work, continue with you, Charlie, and, and us be, you know, kind of lockstep to make sure. Because when you did this, man, I can tell you, when you were on your Heisman run and, and, and you know, the institution Florida State got behind you. But, man, I, I can remember this distinctly. One day you came by my office. And I said, Charlie, what you got for the weekend? You were like, man, you see this closet full of stuff? I got a sign <laughs> and autographs. And I couldn't believe how much work you had almost every couple of days at the athletic department. And it just blew my mind how much work you were doing. And you didn't get paid for any of that. And not that you were looking for that. I mean, I know your DNA, you weren't necessarily looking at But if you were in today's terms, right. man, you could have got, got paid for that Heisman championship uh, type of run that you made in a way that nobody had done it before. You were being asked to do work over and beyond, far beyond any normal student athlete. So what I'm saying now that we're sort of in this age of now student athletes be able to take advantage of this, be wise. Right. Parents don't push your son or daughter before their time. And if you're going to do this, get well informed. Um, Protoceo is a resource if you need to help. And uh, we, we want to see people succeed in doing this. Well, I know you made a lot of great points. Um, you know, things that you've been talking, we've been kind of talking about. And I know the organization has been looking to do as far as the educational uh, part of it for the, for the student athletes and also for the parents. Uh, and, you know, that goes hand in hand with, you know, kind of the, the NBA, the NFL, they have the education components. I remember the time after practices when you guys used to come and talk to us and about just th these types of things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, you know, some people listen, some people did, you know, tune it off and, and what have you. And I just think it's important that if we, we continue to start this early, this understanding. I think a lot of colleges are getting that, getting to that point now. They're starting mm -hmm. to do more life skills with their student athletes. Yeah. Uh, to try to help develop them um, along. I know when we were coming along, we would have some speakers come in, but it was nothing continuous. Um, you know, continuous learning like financial literacy and those types of things. Um, but I just think it's important, as like you said, mentioned, the education component is very, very important. And as you mentioned, also, you know, I did sign, I signed a lot of things. And, you know, they had my pictures on name, on um, debit cards. Now you signed hundreds um, of things.
be modest. You signed a lot of stuff. <laughs> and so, and so I, and, and yes, I, I would have loved to have those things, but I know I would have probably uh, say most of it if, if, but it was all say most of it. Um, or giving some away, which I think that's another aspect to this whole thing is, you know, Florida State, I know there's some other schools is doing it. You know, they're kind of partnering with some other 501c3 ventures that they've come up with, that they've identified with, and now they're using their name and image and likeness to raise money to help support their cause, their goals, the goals that they've set for their program. And, I, you know, that's, that's next level. To me, mm -hmm. when we start mm -hmm. talking about name, image, and likeness, a lot of times we start we stop with ourselves. But when we can collectively come together and use our power, use our name to be able to benefit and help someone else, whether it's throwing a pot, throwing a uh, earning money for uh, a five hundred one c three or foundation, whatever the case may be, then that's next level, and it also brings unity to the mix. So. You know, when if guys start making money and they start putting a portion of their earnings into a foundation, that's when I think we we can go to the next level um, because we talk about the things that they need to learn and I go back to what I had what I had during my time. You know, all the things that I was signing came through FSU, and so right. most of those things happened through FSU. Um, and so I was signing things that was sent to, you know, Miss Sue, Miss Sue's office. Right. And so, yeah. you know, that's something, that's another way we can keep it above board because the other challenge is now, you know, guys are going to have to make tough decisions because people are going to be coming with them, coming at them from the side saying, man, I can, I can get you 3000 in cash. <laughs> why yeah. do I have to go through, why do I go through? <laughs> You know, such and such. And that's very enticing, you know, for a yeah. young person who, man, $3,000 in cash, nobody's going to ever know. Yeah. You see that later on it shows up, um, though. At some point, somebody says something. You're seeing it even, unfortunately, um, some of the things even mentioned with Zion Williams that, you know, you can't control for. Right. So, you know, if you're going to go down that road, not saying anything, stretch of the imagination that he's uh, uh, guilty of anything or his family, but those things come out later if people are insinuating you did stuff to use it against you. So you have to be very careful and stay on track and have a, a philosophy about how you're going to enter this. And that's why, you know, the education and the preparedness that parents need to have as well as to protect their son and daughter from some of the trappings that are going to come through being a high profile student athlete and, 2020, 2021, uh, the, the, the field is changing. The ability to be an influencer has is, is really, really changed uh, the ability to impact sport. And I really think for some of these young men and women, they have a chance to really impact not only their own bottom line, but change societal thoughts. We're looking at social justice issues right now. Um, and just a tweet and a word of encouragement or support you know, can really change and get people active. So I think the platforms for these student athletes, not just from a monetary standpoint, but from a causality and empowerment um, situation is really going to be impacted going forward. I'd love to see more alignment with athletes themselves, empowering um, and lining up with each other. I think there's strength in numbers. I think the younger athletes and the older athletes need to come together. I think it's just sort of like this, sort of vacuum out there that we haven't been able to bring. So, you know, I challenge myself, you know, where I have information. I love to share that with younger athletes. Um, you, Charlie, you have an infinite wisdom that you have been through something that most people will never, ever go through. And, you know, I want to encourage uh, people to know that, you know, <clears throat> and this I'll say my, my, right here about you, Charlie, is you, your humility stands out like nobody else. When I look in the dictionary, it's two people I think about humility, maybe three. Um, my mom, of course, but at the same time, you and, and Tony Dungy, you guys are, have done some amazing things. You remain humble. And I think that's one of the things that 
we can help um, through all of this. How do we stay sort of even keel with as much as going on? How do we look for the good? You know, the word teaches us in you know, despite of what's happening, you know, we still seek for good. You know, we still look to do really good things. And that's the part that I think the platform is for, uh, whether you're seven, uh, 17 years old or you're 37 at your end of your career, you can do a lot of good because the platform is so powerful. And that's why, you know, ProtoCEO encourages athletes to take advantage of the platform that they have while they're playing and then build off of that to create uh, entrepreneurial or at least investment or partnering opportunities because uh, in America, sports can really be a difference maker if you use it the right way. So those are some of the things I would just continue to say, you know, about what you do. You're using a platform wonderful right now, and I applaud you for that. Well, I appreciate it. And, um, you know, it's uh, this is something new for me, this IG Live and having, you know, meaningful conversations, ones that I think people have been enjoying. Uh, we're not slandering people's names or, you know, and all that other kind of stuff. It's more so encouraging people um, in different um, ideologies on how, you know, we've made it, how we've been able to be successful, um, our struggles, you know, to, to how we've gotten to where we are. And everyone has a different point of view on just things that's going on. Um, mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, I mean, it's by the grows now that, you know, t teams are bonding together. And so the yeah. black, the white, you know, all of them are coming together for a common cause, which is great. Um, and we used to see it on the football field, the basketball court, especially mainly the football field. I know when I was coming along, uh, we had these different bonds. Um, like we would have fights in practice and it would be, the, the fights would be um, if one offensive lineman got into a fight with a defensive lineman, it wasn't just them. It was one time we had a big fight um, during practice. It was during the summer, and we the quarterbacks we were down on the bottom field, and oh, we were on the top in the middle field, and the linemen, all the linemen were down. They were doing like board drills or something, and the next thing you know, it was like an all-out brawl, <laughs> and it was and it was all because an offensive lineman and defensive lineman got into uh, a scuffle, but it was a team thing. So they all jumped into the mix, and now we had this big brawl. And, of course, there was a lot of whistles and, of course, you know, ah. some other things. But I brought that up because that's the type of team bond that you need mm -hmm. in order to be successful um, in whatever venture it is that you're trying to get accomplished. And now you see, you're see seeing teams uh, standing together on certain yep. issues. And the coaches, of course, are standing with them now because they all understand unity. Mm -hmm. uh, and th there's uh, strength in numbers, as you mentioned. And so yeah. I think that's that's something that's coming out of this whole new uh, wave of quarantine, COVID-19, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. uh, is, you know, we've had a lot of time to think <laughs> and come together on certain issues and yeah. talk about. But I think the biggest issue is what is right. You know, I, I'm not going to stand for no foolishness. You know, I'm not going to stand united with you for some foolishness. If it's right, then I think, yes, we can all work together. Uh, but I think now that's what you're starting to see is people or guys are bringing up facts, mm -hmm. things that just aren't right and weren't done the right way. Mm -hmm. um, and now they're, they're, they're speaking out about it. And now you got teams, you know, standing because they say, man, that's just not right. Yeah. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot more empathy in people, meaning they're reaching across the table saying, hey, man, what was that like? Or, hey, for the first time, my eyes are open, um, and I want to let you know I, I feel that or I want to feel that and I want to stand with you on this. I, I think uh, the unfortunate turn of events with the passing of George Floyd and many others, even years and years before that, I think it hit a tipping point for a lot of people. And, you know, there was a lot of destruction and such, but I do think that uh, out of that, um, 
I believe we've got people out there championing to try to rectify and bring forth a new awakening. I think our younger people are telling us that they want that. Right. Um, so regardless as someone who's older and what I may think, uh, I have young children who are telling me firsthand the way they feel and think, and as a dad, and as a as a as a as a husband, and as a man that uh, sees and knows and has been around, um, I listen. I'm listening, and I'm first trying to understand where you're coming from, and then I'm trying to understand and bring that in, and then maybe help you understand where I'm coming from. And if we can share in that without arguing each other down. Right, right. Now, going crazy emotion and, you know, take a breath. Don't react with 100% emotion, but try to get that understanding. And then, you know, there's just going to be people who we may not agree with. Right. And, um, we may agree to disagree, but I want to try to be respectful. And not everybody's going to get on the bus, right? But at yeah. the same time, we want to make sure that we are heard now more mm -hmm. than ever. Right. And we want to bring that up so we can't keep you know, bringing up all the great stuff and not bring up the things that are bothering us. So it's real important now where we are to to everybody to have some more empathy and humility, right? And us to look to 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 reconcile things uh, and 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 really move us forward. Um, we're seeing some movement even in my work. Uh, people reaching out to us and saying, "Hey, we need some help in the area of of diversity and inclusion and innovation." How do we move forward with, with more thoughts and better actions and better new processes than we've ever seen before? So we're excited about helping and trying to call, be a part of the solution instead of just standing on the sidelines, man. So I'm thankful for that, for sure. So is that one of your uh, key uh, talking points that you just mentioned about being empathetic, listening, uh, to someone when we talk about diversity and inclusion. Uh, I know that's one prop. Is that one of the aspects that you guys talk about? Yeah. So within our business, we do training at a very, you know, holistic level. We can provide it obviously in professional development and transition and career coaching. But I don't know if you notice, I am a professor uh, adjunct at UCF in the College of Business and School, the School of Business, uh, Sports Business Management with Dr. Richard Labchek and Dr. Keith Harrison. And I teach in the spring, and I teach class of diversity and inclusion and innovation in sports. And we use sports to be a door opener for the conversation of why we need to have more diversity. You know sports better than anybody, Charlie. You can take a white guy from here and a black guy from there and an Indian guy and a Latino guy, and y'all all on the same team. Y'all, if you have chemistry, you don't even see race. It's about getting them yards, getting them first downs, and then getting right. those touchdowns. And I believe, you know, from a sports and, and society, sports can create the attention. I mean, right now we're starved. Uh, we're depraved of sports, and people are starving for that. But I think right now we're seeing sports. Um, the vacuum of it has created awareness that we love it so but also we see are looking for our sports athletes to be involved in society mm -hmm. and have impact and voice. You're hearing people like uh, LeBron and you're seeing, you know, Bubba at NASCAR and you're right. seeing um, um, the the lady, um, um, her name escapes me with Maya women's Moore. soccer. Yeah. You know, just all, Maya Moore. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, shout out to Maya and the work that she's doing. And, and and Megan, uh, the soccer women's soccer um, player, I can't remember yeah, I her last name, but but um, very very good efforts um, of athletes using their platform to do this. So it's real important for me as a professional, where I've gotten a lot of experiences. If you recall, when we were at the NBA, we had the the malice in the palace. You know, right. that was a huge issue that rocked the business like to the core and um out of that came things like nba cares and mm -hmm. us creating the dress code and the uh, conduct code and the social media code and things of that nature and we really you know work with the union to to really change the perception of players and then you know by the gift of god we had lebron come and we had 
you know, D Wade and, and Chris Paul and Carmelo and all of them started assuming um, better uh, like likenesses in terms of what people were seeing about athletes and change that negative persona kd you know all were changing what the perception of the athlete particularly the black athlete could be not only for america but for the rest of the world and now to be quite honest some of the nba players are some of the most recognizable athletes in the world because of a lot of the steps that were taken by them to be more inclusive to be more receptive to what they could do with their platform mm -hmm. and you know lebron keeps amazing me when people look at what he does as a guy who formally educated doesn't have a college degree but as smart as anybody i've right. seen use everything he's got to create and champion so many things and be a leader in some of the first as a current player we He's not even retired, and he's getting <laughs> all these things happening. So what a, what a model that we can look to. Not everybody's got LeBron talent, so, you know, we know talent has something to do with it, but know-how and application and execution of your platform um, is, is important. So that's why I think the diversity and inclusion for athletes who can impact, you know, sports and society – they can help provide a great solution uh, because a lot of people look for them. And if they've got the right attitude and mindset, and that's some of the things we, we teach, Charlie, in, 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 in our work, we, we teach values of, you know, humility and, and, and confidence and having the right attitude. Those are just a couple of them. That kind of helps us create the leadership that we like to see in some of the future roles of athletes while they're playing and while they are working to become CEOs. Yes, those are all, all great uh, values to have, characteristics, um, things that can get you indoors, um, you know, where you can have an in, make an impact uh, on, you know, the overall society and you have a voice that, that can be heard on the platform we have, but also the way you carry yourself um, definitely can go a long ways into, you know, opening some doors for not just yourself, but people that um, may come from your background. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so um, I think that's very important for all of us, you know, not just athletes, but people in general, you know, use your platform to be able to get in where other people may not be able to get in. And then you may be able to open that door for, you know, diversity um, to be mm -hmm. able to enter um, and so, you know, sometimes it takes one. Um, and then on the flip side, you know, that's one of the things I, I work, I'm working now to try to make sure that I'm including, you know, people that don't look like me within my organization. Um, and so that's Absolutely. the other flip side to it. You know, sometimes we get so caught up in, you know, the blacks trying to get into, you know, certain positions and, you know, groups and those and, mm -hmm. uh, organizations and then, mm -hmm. But when we have those, you know, are we doing uh, having that same attitude and mindset as well? Um, just trying to make sure that we have, you know, people that may have a different thought, come from different cultures, you know, at the table with us so that we can service, you know, all of those constituents and those people. Um, because I think it's important, you know, when God sees us, you know, what is he, what is he looking at? You know, sure. what, is my, what is my thought process, my mindset? And so that's the one thing I always have to, you know, remind myself is, you know, what is God thinking, you know, about me? You know, right. when I'm, you know, when I'm making decisions, um, you know, and so I just think it's important that, you know, we, we have, when we are in leadership, that we make sure that we are being inclusive as well and diversifying. Well, that's, that's you know, our network. Yeah, and that's where the, you know, when I, when we began to decide on the class that I would teach, you know, everybody was doing diversity and inclusion. What we thought we needed to add was innovation. And that's not a new word, but to get people to think about diversity and inclusion and make it innovative by just adding 
somebody different to the table. That's innovative for some people because when you have a people around the table that all look alike and you've been doing it the same, that ain't innovative. Right. You know, it's it's a concept out here called similar to me hiring. And that's what people have been doing for the longest, similar to me. Like they think like us. Let's find somebody <laughs> who thinks like us. Let's find somebody who who kind of fits in. Let's make sure that if we get stuck in an airport with that person, they're cool with us. You know, that that's old kind of thinking, to be honest with you. Right now, what the world is calling for and what people are looking to is, are you innovative when you go around the table? Do you have diverse thought, mm. diverse people? And that's what the innovation means, that you got to think differently. Because when you have diverse people around the table, they can see the blind spots. Every mm. once in a while, there's something going to happen in your business. I'll never forget, I was at the NBA, and we're sitting around watching this commercial, right? And everybody's like, hey, that's a good commercial. I was like, no, it's not. Y'all don't see what I say. That's a problem. We will not let that one, don't let that go out. That's an issue. And I think if perhaps maybe that day, um, you know, wouldn't have been around, that might have got by, Charlie, and that might have been an issue later. Right. So that's why the innovation part, to think differently, to have more people who are different than you, is now really good business. It really is. And it's really good as a responsible leader to have women and to have diverse women and have diverse men um, and at different points in their careers and stages. You know, even at the NBA, you know, I can honestly say there were times, you know, NBA has a, uh, a lot of African-American players, but on the management side at the time, it wasn't as diverse as I thought, although the NBA has been a champion and leader uh, in leading all the leagues and having the most senior management people who are diverse. But at, at some point, there were a couple of times I still think, like, wow, we, we need to, this room needs to be a little more diverse. And I think they've really moved in that direction. But there were a couple of times where I felt like when I, after I became vice president, there was um, times where I was like, wow, we, we still need, we still have work to do. There's yeah. still work to do. Uh, well, as we close, I just want to ask about your organic farming. <laughs> how, how, did right. you, how did you and your wife get to having, uh, right. Cows in the backyard and chickens. No, I ain't got no cows, man. <laughs> Come on now. That's nothing like that. Well, I think, you know, uh, health is a big part of everybody's, um, or it should be a big part of everybody's agenda, to be honest with you. Um, if you haven't um, at all committed to a health regimen, you know, uh, unfortunately, COVID has brought that to our attention. Uh, unfortunately, it's disproportionately affected people of color as well. And the health of how we go forward, health has a lot to do with it. You know, we know and have heard pre-existing conditions have really contributed to and exacerbated some um, and impacted our community a lot more. So the commitment I made a long time ago was uh, when my wife and I had our first child, she, at the same time, her grandmother was passing mm -hmm. of cancer so one life was passing because it was getting eaten away from some of the things that may have been the food and sort of the things exposed to and another life was coming in. It was a real pivotal moment um, that she had talked about. She said, hey, going forward, we're gonna be all about health. And I remember the first grocery bill we got from an organic food market. I was like, hey, wait a minute, what is going on? Like this bill is outrageous. She's like, look, pay me now or pay me later. <laughs> and all I could think about is she said like something about like look you know what a typical visit in a hospital is like and I said no she says probably about $55,000 if you stay in a week in a hospital she said or we can just spend more on grocery keep our health better and it won't cost you 55000 but it'll be a couple more hundred dollars over a week or so and I just said okay no, no fighting with you on it and then uh, just, she became a real champion of that, and she works in the farming business now. I'm a benefactor of that. I've learned a lot about why my health is my wealth, and I say that your health is your wealth. Um, a lot of us fight, you know, hey, it has to be all green salads. No, it doesn't. It does have to be portion control. It does have to be, you know, what 
they're putting in the food that they're growing. You got to be careful that it's not modified. When you see GMO on the package, that means gen genetically modified um, uh, organism, GMO. Mm -hmm. You want to make sure that it's GMO free. That way they haven't augmented the seeds because when you consume that, you're consuming that seed. You don't know what it's doing to your DNA or future DNA. Mm -hmm. So you want to be real mindful of that. And then organic doesn't mean that it's sprayed with bad stuff. Organic means that they've done the best they can to not spray it and to make it pesticide free. Go ahead, man. Hey, uh, we got like, tw we're almost about to close out. Okay. okay. So, um, but I do appreciate you uh, being on and um, I appreciate, uh, hopefully we can have another talk about farming. All right. Hey, hey health uh, is a big part of how we're all going to have longevity. Be glad to have Jumping back on. Got an opportunity to meet him at FSU. And um, so, all right, you can finish off your health as well. <laughs> which... No, I just want to officially say goodbye. Oh. I hate to cut you off. We can definitely do that um, next time, man, anytime you want. If there's anything you want me to say, I will. But we, we, can, we can definitely connect uh, back. I know you got your group. But thanks for the opportunity. And uh, let's stay in touch, man. Well, you know, I appreciate you very much. Um, and definitely when you start talking about health and wealth, um, right now my alley, and I'm I'm full bore with it now. Uh, I know with this COVID deal. Uh, so I'm definitely full bore. Uh, just trying to find better ways for our health to be enhanced um, through this, through this, um, this time. Um, and I'm trying to share as so that we can enhance, um, you know, our understanding, our knowledge base. I think that's the biggest key. A lot of times we, um, we don't understand something, and so we'll just go with what we're used to or what others say. Um, and so what I've come to grips with, and Taj has been doing, you know, this for quite some time, and I'm just yeah. jumping, I just jumped on board, you know, later in my career, trying to extend my career uh, by eating healthier um, and doing those types of things. Uh, make sure I'm doing my vitamins and minerals and all the different alternative um, proce uh, procedures that I can actually, you know, to help, help me with my health uh, while I was playing. Um, and now, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's just understanding what goes in your body <laughs> you know mm -hmm. it, it, it goes in for a reason and it's going to come out in some form yep. of fashion and so yep. how it comes out and once it goes in what is it doing uh plays a big part for sure right no no i agree um one of the things i'll try to be brief on here is it's really um about mindset um and your mindset has to kind of start with find your why why are you kind of eating the way you are and if you want to change that you got to find a new why uh for me i had two cousins die before the age of 30 uh 38 one was 38 and one was 37 and these are like first cousins these are in my mm. my mom's sister's children and my mom had diabetes uh she's 75 but for me, I didn't know my dad. He grew up, I grew up without him. So I didn't know his health history. So that concerned me and having cousins pass away early. And then my wife, who was a big health advocate, she just got us going and I just have maintained that. Um, like you, I try to keep my weight down. I've been fairly successful when I think about how uh, over the years I could have bloomed up, but I really wanted to make sure that I was practicing as best I could, you know, strategies. So, man, all I did was similar before it became popular was the paleo. I just had, you know, greens and I had a small portion of meat. I really wasn't a sweets person. And then I just have a lot of in between. So my snacking, if I got a little edgy and hungry, because everybody does, you know, I, I have 
some nuts mm -hmm. or I would have a yogurt um, or I would chase my hunger with a lot of water. Um, mm -hmm. And it would just kind of ward me off. And then I was just a focused person. I love to, to work. So I just would pour myself. And sometimes I would even blow past the uh, lunchtime because I was into yeah. what I'm doing. Yeah. So I think people find comfort in food when you're not as mission driven. So I think part of it is mindset. Like find something that you like to do and don't, um, when you do have food, don't use it to totally associate you and fill you up like a buffet. Mm -hmm. Allow the choices that you make to be, you know, where you, you have a little more control and make sure it's just healthy. So if it's a salad, have a, a meat with it. If you're a meat eater or you just have more of the greens or a fruit or some type of starch like a potato, and you don't even have to have meat. We have sort of like a program around here where it's like meatless Monday, uh, <laughs> har harvest taco Tuesday, whatever Wednesday. Wednesday's a cheat day. I will say that. So everybody's on their own so they don't go crazy around here. And then, you know, it's pasta Thursday. And then, you know, kids might want pizza on Friday. And, and, and honestly, Friday, I'm so done during the week that I don't really cook a big meal. I might have just an easy, chill um um, you know, bowl of a soup or something like that. And then, um, and then Saturday is a sandwich and then Sunday is a big meal because you want to commit, we want to create family and stuff, uh, around that. But outside of that, man, I think you got to figure out your program, what works for you and stay with it yeah. man, and it'll treat you well. Well, speaking of that, I'm heading off on Tuesdays. Most Tuesdays I, I, I cook. Okay, uh, so, what you got? So today, got? so today, I'm cooking meatloaf. Uh, uh yeah. Meatloaf. My, uh, All right, is it uh, organic meatloaf? Or uh, is it bison well, or turkey I'm, or beef? I, I have to cook two meatloafs because one's okay. for the kids and then one's right. for Taj and I because she doesn't eat meat either. Um, oh, okay. And so we have Beyond the Meat Burger. Meat. Okay. So we have to try to I have to work that part to try to get it to. You know, stand up when it when it gets to a certain point. But um, I'm familiar with. And then we have mac we have macaroni and cheese. Um, of course, we yeah. we have uh, vegan cheese going on with ours. Um, yeah. And then I'm cooking kale. Nice. So nice. <laughs> we'll see. You got to get the soups, brother. You gotta you gotta get the soups going. The soups stretch you over a day or two if you yeah you, you don't. Cook again, I'm, so I'm, that might be a good way. I'm not good with the soups. I've tried the soups, and they turn out to be <laughs> something totally different. You know what the secret to soup is to make it taste good? <laughs> is garlic, minced garlic, and sesame oil. I'm trying to tell you, uh, that's, that's going to add yeah. that zest. It's going to add the zest. for you and then add your veggies just be careful okay well uh, like i said sometimes I, I i started out as soup and then it turns into like a um souffle <laughs> <laughs> oh, so so I'm, I'm still trying to figure it out tanja does great i mean she's been doing it for some time and i just started you're not this. working with the chicken broth right huh? you got to add chicken Bro, yeah, add chicken broth. Uh, we do. Okay. Uh, well, I don't do chicken broth because I don't do meat. But um, vegetable broth. Uh, yeah, we, I, I do vegetable, vegetable broth. broth. Uh, so that's just. I'm just trying to. I'm just still learning. You know, for certain things. Certain things I'm okay with, <laughs> and they, I can make them taste good. But I'm still learning about the soups, and I think I did um, like a vegetable soup or something one time that turned out. You know, it looked like vegetable soup, uh, but I'm still working with some of the other ones. But I'll let you know how how it all turns out next time. I well, let me say say this: men often don't want to cook, but I think there's a sense of need these days because you really are at home now, and you want to put together some things that are going to help you know your health. Because if you're at the house now and you're not moving. You picking up weight, so you gotta really watch what your intake is, cause uh, you can get them quarantine pounds too. <laughs> that so is true. You want to be careful, you want to be real careful with your meal control, cause now being at home is comfortable, and 
you getting a little antsy and edgy and the, take that edge off the food, you know, or wanting to do something, sometimes you find comfort in food. So again, mindset and, you know, preparing things that, that are healthier for you. So like you said, kale, um, you know, collard greens, um, there are several types of spinaches and kale that you can go with that really help you. And then just, you know, try to commit to putting that on every uh, meal and just adding that because um, it's going to help help you stay a lot more healthy and feed your body. And, and it makes a lot of sense over time because yeah. as you age, your muscle composition changes, as you know, um, your digestive tract can change. And, you know, for me, I know a lot of people work out and they have a good looking body but then you chase it with a lot of chicken wings, you know, <laughs> that, that, that ain't always the best thing. So you want to have uh, a quotient of you know, meat and a, a fruit and a veggie um, if you're a meat eater. Right. And, or you don't have to do the meat, like take, give your body a break every other day, just go with a little portion, man. So you're doing the right thing, man. Keep encouraging us to eat well. Cause you keeping the weight off, man. You look like you playing in college right now. <laughs> Trust me, I'm not playing, for sure. <laughs> but you know, I like I said, I'm I'm plant based um, solely now, and I like today, Tuesday and Thursdays we have a uh, bike club. We ride our bikes. Um, that's something new for me. Uh, when I had my stroke, like two and a half, like two and a half years ago or so. Um, I, I, I didn't know you had, I didn't know you had, you had a stroke. Yeah. Um, I totally I got that. away. Uh, most of it was stress, but I totally got away from, um, the lifestyle eating habits. Um, and I was doing, like you were saying earlier, I was feeding my face with, you know, stress foods and I wasn't exercising, um, you know, even partially. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I, Kept, I was up at like 190. I wasn't weight wasn't really the issue. It was more so what was going in, and then my arteries and all those types of things, and then stress on top of that started to pile up. And I had an episode uh, about two and a half years ago. But and then I went to a cardiologist who uh, helped me to understand. He's a plant-based um, doctor, and so he works to try to help. Uh, all of his patients get off of medication, and so he does it through food. Um, and, okay. And, and so that's that's the way he does it. And he's a plant-based guy, so he started me off with a raw diet for like four weeks, um, then gradually pushed me towards a plant-based diet, and I've kind of st stuck with it um, since that time. And and it's worked for me, you know. It's, uh, I've enjoyed it, and then it's worked for other people that I've heard as well, you know, that's yeah. done that. Um, just to fast alone uh, for those four weeks, you know, definitely set me set my body um, off to a good pace. Uh, right. It, re it retrained it. Um, it got to a point where it got back balanced. Mm -hmm. um, and so now, you know, my numbers are always kind of been good, but you know, I've numbers and all those types of things, you know, they're normally good. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm great, you know, for, yeah, man, for it, for sure. Uh, yeah. I think you're, I mean, obviously what a testimony. I, I, I didn't know that, man. So I'm even more, um, more proud and happy for you. Uh, that you recognize that. I will say this is that even in my business, you know, I train my clients to be the CEO of what you eat, mm. like to be in charge, to have a mindset of, you know, just don't dump everything in you. Think about, you know, is this going to help me or this is going to hurt me? Right. Like real simple, you know, I'm not saying your body is like a Ferrari, but you just won't put any old thing in a Ferrari. Think of your body as a really treasured resource that you got to be with for a long time. And is this going to help you be better five years from now, you know, and you're aging, like everybody's getting older, you know, whether you realize it or not. And with your food intake, it can really 
help your skin better, help your hair stay. You know, I got still got my hair, y'all. I mean, just all of it. <laughs> all of it. I believe, I believe it works together. Right. Um, and so I actually use this philosophy with my clients and I say, you know, what about what you're eating? And I said, if you eat, uh, if you eat better, you will lead better. Mm. It will keep your stress down. It will allow you to think for longer periods. It will allow you to transfer that energy too up to you know where it should be. And when people feel your energy, they they love asking you, "What what are you doing?" Like all that stuff, and you get to share that and like, maybe uh, influence somebody else. So you know, I have these meals that I've cooked, I never put them out there because I, you know, I keep them kind of like just reminders of what kind of meals when I get bored. Because I can, every once in a while I can hook it up, Charlie. Don't, don't, I'm sure. Don't, don't, don't guess now. <laughs> don't sleep on the skills. Um, and I'm saying that uh, jokingly, but I do take some time to prepare meals that look good. So I want to eat them. Mm, you know what I mean? Right. So I do make sure the plate has a, a, a arrangement from time to time. Um, so I think if people put a little bit more work behind, they'll enjoy the food. Uh, and then at the same time, when you eat better, you lead better. And it manifests into the kind of work that I'm able to do and work for long periods of time um, because I, I, be, I believe what I'm putting in my body is great fu fuel for me. Right. And I believe that it's going to help me long term. So I, I'm careful about how much I put in. And I think a big part of it is portion control. I really do because mm -hmm. some people eat to fill up. Right. I eat enough, and if you know, if I miss a meal, I don't sweat. I right. just chase it with an apple, um, some some nuts, and I just didn't get my sandwich and and chips and whatever I did for lunch or a big salad. So I think it's okay too not to have three majorly programmed meals a day. Sometimes your body, they say you can go without eating, can't go without water, water right. a long time. But you can go without eating, so. That's just my little two cents, man. But the health thing is real, and as, as and if you get up there in age, um, you want to be real, even more mindful that everything you put in your body can make a difference. Uh, that is true, and um, and so I appreciate you, brother. And uh, yep, tell the family say hello, and uh, yep. uh, hopefully I know at one point in time we'll connect on this uh, nil uh, educational <laughs> component. Yeah, able to share. Uh, hopefully, we can help some people just Absolutely. think through some some things. Uh, but I appreciate your time and some great wisdom you share with us. And may God continue to bless you and your business. Yep. Well, I appreciate it. Can I leave? Just hey, if anybody needs help through transition, uh, particularly athletes, if you know one, uh, high school all the way to retired, we do everything in between. Pro to CEO.com, P R O the number two CEO.com. Um, you know, it's a ministry for me. I really do think of it like I'm called to do this. I've been doing this ever since I saw my brother not make it in um, college football, and I've just been led. And I was fortunate to get to the highest level like you. And then when I didn't think I could go further, you know, the Lord showed me I could do Pro to CEO and introduced me to some powerful people. and you know, six years later, man, you know, I'm the creator and director and and um, originator of this platform. And it just keeps surprising me the kind of people and opportunities people are coming to us with. So even in the midst of COVID, we've, we've been able to sustain ourselves and actually reinvent ourselves and be as busy, if not busier, um, you know, working from home and helping people through platforms, all this technology that we have, you know, I embraced it, you know, years ago. I had, I've had Zoom for years because I knew the power of it. I knew the ability to, you know, um, come up with your own uh, ideals. And one day I would have to tap into them. You know, I'm on my second book now. It's going to come out soon. Awesome. So, you know, this time of quiet has prepared uh, has been a preparing time. And um, I believe a lot of people, if you got something going, you know, this is a great time to get it going, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, we just have to believe that we have more faith in our faith in terms of our projects and what we're doing versus the fear of not having them come to reality. Spend more time in your mind that you believe that you're going to achieve it um, because you're equipped to do that. And 
versus, oh, I don't know. I don't have the money. Oh, I don't have the know-how. I don't have the talent. I don't know the right people. Mm -mm. You got to spend more time over here saying, I can, I will. I see it. I believe it. Um, and that's how I've been able to, to see my way through. I spend more time focusing on the positive, as you know, and what, what God can do if you put forth the effort and introduce you to people you never saw coming and he had it all originally planned for you. Um, so yeah, man, we, we are there. I, I'm looking forward to us building and, and continue to grow. All right. Well, the crazy thing is you have a twin, right? <laughs> and on Thursday, oh. I'm talking to Gina. What? <laughs> uh, and she's a twin. Of course, you know, Kate. Hey, so that one to twin power is amazing. <laughs> tell her, tell my one to twin sister, what's up? Oh, uh, let's have a few people. Now, yeah, yeah. Now Gina, she went the other way, but we still cool. We still cool. Tell her, I know she. I love uh, Florida. As long as we're not playing Florida State, yeah, we good. <laughs> <laughs> That's gonna be a good one. What time is that? Uh, tuning in. Hopefully, around the same time, three p.m. Around, yeah, Gina is amazing. I can't wait to hear her story. She's she's been um, she's been scoring touchdowns for a long time in business. Yeah. So well, I'm looking forward yeah. to it. Hopefully, I can hook her up with Hope, our daughter. Uh, oh she's, wow, she's interested in sports uh, management um, as well, and so hopefully she can um, connect with her or Kate because they're both in sports, you know, in some form of fashion. So. You know, yeah. she, hopefully we can connect her, and because uh, hope is she has that type of mind mindset. So right, and as you mentioned, Absolutely. relationships <laughs> we need to use relationships, <laughs> relationships, relationships. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, brother. All right, man. Appreciate you. I appreciate you. Take care. Be well. Be blessed. All right. You have a good one. Take care. All right. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye. All right, well, <laughs> again, we went long and had to go again. Uh, but it was a great conversation uh, with uh, Kevin. Um, and, you know, it was just, just some great uh, conversation. I just, I, I'm blessed to be able to talk to some of my friends. Um, and they have great wisdom, you know, to helping us that are listening. And also, I know for me, um, just understand how to make it. 